In the 14th century, the Black Death swept across a Europe ridden with famine and war. In just two years, this terrible plague was to claim over 20 million lives. Medieval man's struggle against a mysterious disease would alter the course of European history and prove a devastating turning point. In a remote lake region of Central Asia, the Bacillus Yersinia pestis lay for hundreds of years in the blood of wild rodents. Then, in 1338, a drought or an earthquake violently disturbed the balance of nature. Driven from its natural habitat, the Bacillus began a deadly exodus. From its cradle in Central Asia, the plague slowly migrated towards man. It was carried in the bloodstream of black rats and in the fleas which fed on them. The bacillus spread quickly as it moved along trade routes in the blood of infected rats. With it came the plague, spreading like a deadly river of death, first into China and then south into India and west into Egypt and Asia Minor. Within eight years, it had reached the Crimea. Rumors of a terrible plague raging in the east began to circulate through the Mediterranean seaports. But no one thought this disease would strike Europe. A group of Italian merchants, expelled from their trading post of Tana, had taken refuge in the fortified city of Caffa on the Black Sea. Tensions between the Christian merchants from Italy and the local Muslim residents erupted in a street brawl. A minor skirmish soon became a war. The Muslims sought help from their local Mongol prince to lay siege to the Italians inside the walls of Caffa. The siege was almost a year old when the plague erupted amongst the Mongol army. So many soldiers died that they were forced to call off the siege. But before they withdrew, the prince came up with a deadly plan, one of the first and most highly effective forms of germ warfare. Giant wooden siege machines were already lined up outside the city walls. Now, the Mongol prince ordered his troops to load the catapults with a deadly new missile. One by one, the rotting carcasses of plague-infected soldiers were hurled through the air over Kaffa's walls.
what seemed like mountains of dead were thrown into the city. Soon the rotting corpses tainted the air and poisoned the water supply. Within days, the people inside the walls of Kaffa began to die. Those merchants who could escape hurried aboard their galleys and prepared to set sail for Italy. Flea-infested rats climbed the mooring ropes and hid in the holds of the ships that were heading for the Mediterranean. Little did the sailors know what a deadly cargo they were carrying. No one noticed that the shipboard rats were diseased. The galleys sailed from port to port on their long journey back to Italy, but no one would let them dock when it was seen that the sailors were dying. In October 1347, the merchants finally reached the port of Messina in Sicily. The terrified harbour masters tried to isolate the ships, but it was already too late. Even as the first mooring ropes were being tied, the rats were making their way ashore. Although the galleys were forced to move on, this brief encounter was long enough for the Black Death to enter Europe. Europe in 1348 was already overpopulated and beset with problems. Weakened by wars, harvest failures, famines and other epidemics, the plague was yet another in a series of disasters to strike Europe. Churches were centers of learning with unquestioned authority over the population. With no other explanations of life to turn to, people looked to the church and their local priest for spiritual support and solace. Michael of Piazza, a Franciscan friar, received news of the outbreak of plague just days after its arrival in Sicily. He prayed to God that the disease would not spread. But his prayers were not answered. Within days, everyone who had had any contact with the dying sailors was dead. After a week, the plague had spread throughout the city of Messina. Carts loaded with corpses arrived at the churches almost by the hour. Men were born to burial by day and night with only a short service. The houses of the dead were shut up for no one dared enter them. Those living in already overcrowded houses were oblivious to the arrival of the infected black rats. Fleas thrived in the filth and clung to the clothes of the dead, which were then sold or passed on. When anyone who is infected by the disease dies, all who visit him or do business with him or even carry him to the grave, quickly follow him there. As the plague spread into the surrounding countryside, it was clear that no one was safe. Within a month, 
the Black Death had spread throughout Sicily. Friar Michael set off on a journey round the island. Believing the plague was decreed by God and that man should not oppose it, he hoped to bring spiritual comfort to the sick. Many priests had already died, but Michael was one of the few who would survive the plague and live to describe its horrors. <coughs> on the day the victim was stricken, blisters and boils appeared on the arms, legs and neck. They so weakened and tormented his body that he had to take to his bed. Soon the boils grew to the size of a walnut, then to that of a hen's egg or a goose's egg, and they were exceedingly painful. The sickness lasted three days. By the fourth day, the plague had claimed another victim. People reacted to the plague with astonishment, bewilderment and terror. They thought they were witnessing the end of the world, God's punishment for all the sin on earth. that your anger may cease, that you do not destroy sinners in this way, and that you do not allow the just to be condemned with the unjust. Most people believed that the plague was literally hell on earth, the last triumph of evil before the coming of Christ in judgment. With hundreds dying every day, Michael was one of the few priests still devoted enough to give the last rites and pray for the souls of the dying. Such was the number of victims that there was no more hallowed ground in which to bury the dead. Corpses lay abandoned. Bodies were buried, hundreds at a time, in plague pits outside the city walls. What more is there to say? Corpses lay unattended in their own homes. No priests, sons, fathers, or kinsmen dared to enter. Few who caught the disease ever recovered. So rapidly did it spread that it seemed one man could infect the whole world. Ships, with their lethal cargoes of infected rats and fleas, were the surest and fastest means of spreading the plague. Within days of a ship putting into port, the entire town would have been exposed to the deadly bacillus. From Sicily, the plague reached the mainland and swept across Italy. Following the trade routes, it spread in all directions, covering the land with a blanket of death. Travelers told stories of deserted villages and miles of countryside littered with bodies. In early 1348, Guy de Chiliac, a cleric, and the Pope's personal doctor heard news that the Black Death was only weeks from the Papal Palace at Avignon. Guy studied the movement of the stars and planets and reported his findings to his master, Pope Clement VI. He explained that God's warnings, heavy clouds, blasts of hot winds, falling stars, and a column of fire seen above the Papal Palace all signaled that a terrible affliction was at hand. The configuration of the heavens is the cause of this pestilence. 
In 1345, at one hour after noon on March the 20th, there was a major conjunction of three planets in Aquarius. This signifies death. At once, de Chiliac scoured the books of Arab philosophers and physicians and the reports of the medical faculty in Paris for advice on how to avert the impending disaster. The philosophers advised that the corrupted air should be purified with fire. This would drive away the infected cloud that caused the plague. So when the plague was in reach of the Pope's palace, de Chiliac ordered huge fires to be built within the papal grounds. Then the doctor arranged for the Pope to sit between them. The Pope's fires burned day and night for four months, while the plague raged through Avignon. No rat or flea could penetrate the intense heat. The Pope sat, protected, in splendid isolation, all through the heat of the summer. Meanwhile, in the city of Avignon, thousands continued to die. They believed that the corrupted atmosphere had infected the population with plague. Regardless of the risk to himself, Guy de Chiliac visited the sick throughout the epidemic. The disease was most humiliating for doctors who were unable to help. If they risked visiting their patients, they could do no good and so earned no fees, for almost all the infected died. After several grueling weeks, de Chiliac finally fell ill himself. Observing the telltale boils on his own body, he took to his bed, fearing he might have only days to live. For the next six weeks, he attempted to treat himself. Believing his body had been corrupted by the infected cloud, he submitted to regular bleedings, using a heated cup to draw his blood to the surface of the skin and so draw out the poisons. Whenever he could summon the strength, he would record his symptoms in detail. To his surprise, he began to record a recovery. Having survived the plague, de Chiliac was even more determined to continue his research. It was not long before he made a breakthrough. It was of two types. The first with continuous fever and spitting of blood. From this, one died in three days. The second, also with continuous fever, but with carbuncles on the armpits and groin. From this, one died in five days. De Chiliac had correctly diagnosed that there were two types of plague, and that the first, pneumonic plague, was more infectious and more deadly than the second, bubonic plague. So remarkable was this discovery that the Pope, for the first time, gave his blessing to the dissection of the dead, which had previously been forbidden as a sin. Most people had no confidence in doctors. The rich simply fled from the plague, but most could not. Sometimes the sick were even bricked up in their houses to stop the disease from spreading, but to no avail. Some tried to find their own cures. They took pills made of stag's horn or potions of powdered gold. Desperate times called for desperate measures. Take a live frog and lay the belly of it next to the plague sore. If the patient will escape the plague, the frog will burst. Having escaped the plague, the Pope sought to prevent its spread elsewhere. He ordered devout processions and encouraged ceremonies that involved a new sect the flagellants. They practiced self-flagellation in an attempt to purge mankind of sin. 
flagellants roamed the countryside, believing that their self-imposed pain and suffering would cause God to lift his curse and save the world. Before long, the flagellants openly criticized the Catholic Church for failing the people at this crucial time. They interrupted religious services and looted church property. In their search for scapegoats, they falsely accused the Jews of poisoning the drinking water. Throughout Europe, Jews were massacred. The Pope realized that the movement he himself had encouraged was now a grave threat to public order. He sent letters to the kings of Europe, ordering them to suppress the flagellants. The movement disappeared, but their descent added to a growing feeling that perhaps the established church was no longer absolute. This dissension would resurface 150 years later in the Great Reformation. The plague would stay in any one place for several months and then move on. In just two years, it had swept across Western Europe, spread north over to England, and then finally to Scandinavia. By 1350, it had run its course. The Black Death killed a third of Europe's population. Over 20 million people died. This devastation was a turning point that changed the face of Europe beyond recognition. Michael of Piazza recorded the chaos that the plague had left in its wake. Families were torn apart, villages deserted, business collapsed, states bankrupted by loss of taxes. Those who survived bore the burden of guilt. A new mentality emerged. There was a strengthened belief in God, but an increased skepticism about the established church. Shortage of labor had shifted the balance of power between the lords and their tenants. Authority and tradition were no longer accepted without question. The cause of the plague would remain a mystery until the late 19th century. It was then discovered that the rats and fleas were the carriers of the bacillus but that it was the fleas that transmitted the disease from the rats to man. A single flea bite can cause death. After the Black Death, the plague returned to haunt Europe every few decades until the mid 17th century, though never again with the ferocity of that first outbreak. Even today, the terror that it created can still be heard in the nursery rhyme that children sing.
Constantinople, the greatest city of its time and the gateway to Europe. For centuries, the Muslims had tried and failed to conquer the Christians in their impregnable walled city. If Constantinople were ever to fall, the whole of Europe would be vulnerable. With the roar of cannon fire, the East gave warning to the West that people were no longer safe behind their city walls. In 1453, the Muslims were trying again, and this time with a new weapon. A weapon so powerful that even Constantinople's massive battlements might not withstand the pounding. If the combination of a determined Muslim leader and this fantastic new weapon could break the stalemate, the siege of Constantinople would truly be one of history's turning points. For 800 years, Constantinople was the world's richest city, center of trade, bridging Asia and Europe. When Rome fell to the barbarians in the fourth century, Constantinople took its place as the capital of the great Roman Empire. But 11 centuries later, this once great empire had shrunk to little more than an impoverished city-state. Its new leader, Constantine XI, ruled over a capital that was bankrupt, its lush gardens overgrown, its palaces deserted, and its people dispersed. Yet Constantinople remained the center of the Orthodox Christian Church, while Rome was the center of the Catholic Church. Each were jealous of the other's power and influence. This division was so great that to Rome, the Orthodox Church was an even greater enemy than Islam. What was to follow was a brutal Christian feud. But the city would always remember how the Roman Catholic Crusaders bloodily sacked Constantinople in 1204 when it possessed two-thirds of Europe's wealth. One horrified eyewitness wrote at the time, I do not know where to begin the story of what these monsters committed. They broke the holy images. They hurled the sacred relics of the martyrs into unmentionable places 